Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at Dr. Gary Habermas, PhD, and uh, his minimal fact approach of the resurrection. We'll play some more of him, read a bit of his PhD, and I'll take you from there. I'm going to use this minimal facts method that says this. Almost nothing I'm going to share with you. Now, I'm going to start giving some with another method. And I'll tell you when I'm going to start doing the minimal facts method. I'm going to do another method called the reliability method, the middle one first. But what I'm going to do when I get to the minimal facts portion is I'm going to use texts that scholars allow, skeptical scholars. No matter how skeptical they are, uh, atheists, that's fine. Be as skeptical as you want. I'm only asking, I'm only using data from scholars who know the field. By that I mean somebody with a terminal degree, peer-reviewed publications, have a position where they work in this area. That's criteria we use. You know, when you go to a medical doctor, when you go to a lawyer, when you go to somebody else, you want somebody who's a specialist in your area that's going to give you the best possible advice and fix you up with whatever you need. So sometimes we have a bunch of websites that are readily available, and if that's your thing, if you want to go to the websites where all the scholars are folks with BAs who are out of their area and they claim to be scholars and they don't do any work in the area, I mean, that's fine. It's America. You can do what you want. But I'm just saying, if you go to the scholarly websites where people are as skeptical as possible and they are atheists, atheist New Testament scholars, they're going to admit a body of data. This is one of the most misunderstood things. Skeptical scholars will allow you to use the New Testament. In fact, if you don't use it, they will. Because they think there are some worthwhile passages. That's the only thing I'm going to use is their data. And my thesis tonight is going to be, if you take a skeptical look at the New Testament, use the data they allow, there's enough data to show that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's my approach. Now, that much on methodology, a couple things about historiography. And while I'm doing that, I'll step down here. You know, when you do historiography, you ask about whether an event occurred in history. There are certain criteria. Let me tell you real quickly a, a little story that you'll get the point, how this works. Years ago, my son was, many years ago, my son was eight years old. And we were sitting at the dinner table. We often had, we often would uh, read scripture with our family before dinner. And we had that time, and my son sat there, and we were done, and we prayed for the meal. And he said, Dad... My Sunday school teacher asked us this week, he wants us to report next week, how do we know the resurrection of Jesus happened? And I said, Rob, how do you know George Washington was the first president of the United States? He goes, come on, Dad. I asked, how do you know if the resurrection of Jesus happened? I said, no, Rob, I'm being serious. How do you know George Washington was the first president of the United States? He stopped and goes, you read books. And I said, what kind of books? He's eight years old. And he, and he goes, I guess you'd want to read a book from somebody who knew George Washington. Okay? What kind of a person who knew George Washington would, what kind of a, so we just kind of worked on this for a few moments and we thought, you know, if they were there, especially if it was enemy testimony, someone who hated George Washington, hated what he stood for, but he believed he was a courageous person or he was a good military leader or something like that or, you know, anything like that would be really, really helpful. And he said, when he finished, he goes, okay. In other words, when you ask about the resurrection, you do history. And I don't know, because probably because we're in the middle of a meal, he just said, okay. And he never asked about resurrection. And I kind of forgot about it, and he kind of forgot about it, and we kept eating. And about a week later, he got home. We were at dinner again, and I said, hey, how'd that go with your Sunday school teacher asking you how we know Jesus was raised from the dead? He said, yeah, he came into class, and he said, how do we know? And he, I put my hand up, and he said, Rob? And he said, how do you know George Washington was the first president of the United States? <laughs> this is a true story, and the, and the teacher went, what? And then he goes, oh, wait a minute. You're having me as this kid, aren't you? So, I mean, it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard to put some of these things together. You do resurrection like you do historical data, and you're not pulling any punches. You're not, like inventing spiritual history to prove something, I'm going to be using facts the way the critics use it tonight, okay? So I'm going to start down here. I'm going to start with the timeline because two of the most important things we can do in history is to get early. Okay, he's going to talk more about that in a minute. And we'll, um, we'll 
continue with Habermas's PhD. He, he, he moves on from Hume and he quotes uh, C.S. Lewis. Now, of course, we must agree that Hume, that is, if, if he were absolutely uniform experience against miracles, if in other words they have never happened, why then they've never happened? Now, of course, we must agree. Oh, sorry, uh, page 90 on um, Habermas's PhD, quoting C.S. Lewis, I think. Of course, we must agree with you that if there is absolutely uniform experience against miracles, if in other words they have never happened, why then they have never happened? Unfortunately, we know that all reports of them, unfortunately, we know that, well, we don't know that all reports of them are false. And we can know all the reports to be false only if we know already that the miracles have never occurred in fact we are arguing in a circle page 90 this is done without any real investigation to determine the experience on behalf of miracles to establish the validity um, he, he, he quotes, I think, C.S. Lewis, just because the laws of nature, just because there are laws of nature, this does not mean that occasional abnormalities cannot occur, page 91. So basically, David Hume saying, look, we have these general laws of nature, we don't see dead people rising, therefore miracles don't happen. But that implies that there is a, that we know the totality of all experience and we don't, so we must be willing to be open to the data. C.S. Lewis, probabilities of this kind that Hume is concerned with hold inside the framework of an assumed uniform of nature. When the question of miracles is raised, we are asking about the validity or perfection of the frame itself. No study of probabilities inside a given frame can ever tell us how probabil probable it is that frame itself can be vi violated. So the whole idea and say, well, it, it's impossible that that Jesus rose from the dead because we don't see any dead people doing that. And the probability is pretty high that he didn't. Presumes that there is a um, it knows the whole of uniform experience of, of human nature. And the fact is that we don't, and so therefore we have to be open to those data that w might tell us differently. As we have said above, we can only know that there is a uniform experience against all miracles if he has investigated all of the serious claims. It's interesting to note that most atheists and skeptics don't investigate miracle claims. Page 96, it is indeed an intellectually secure person who can know that these events can never occur without any investigation whatsoever. That's Habermas, page 95, I think it is. It's interesting to note, uh, Dr. Habermas mentions that uh, David Hume on page 98 of his PhD, Habermas's PhD, he noticed that there are famous scholars um, I I Catholic scholars and thinkers um, who lived a century before Hume who he investigated who claimed that they had miracle experiences and Hume was found that his criteria for judging miracles was actually met and that in reality he should believe in miracles but he still wouldn't believe even though his criteria was met Hume says, what is more extraordinary, many of the miracles were immediately proved upon the spot before judges of unquestioned integrity, and yet Hume still wouldn't believe. 